What is up, guys? Chase Oliver 68 here, bringing you another wrestling roundtable um, discussion with my boy Alan Sirk. But this is going to be a little bit different. Now, usually when we do these, we go probably two hours or an hour and a half talking about professional wrestling. But um, Alan and I have really decided that that's not the route we want to take. And, and the reason is, is because... You know, I already talk about wrestling weekly on my channel. I do the Q&As, I do raw reviews, I do subject videos. And really, to be honest, I don't have time to talk about other sports. Like, I don't have time to do MMA videos. I don't have time to do sports videos like NBA and NFL. So he, he said, how about we talk about other subjects? You know, talk about wrestling for like already pretty much if you combine all my videos that I do on wrestling on my channel a week for almost 50 minutes, it's kind of boring. And I, I, I would love to talk about other subjects. So what we want to do is, you know, this podcast that you're watching right now, it will, will be pretty much the WWE and MMA podcast. So for all you guys that love those together, you can watch this one. Then the next podcast I'm going to upload later will be the sports podcast talking about the NFL draft and the NBA playoffs. So that way you guys do not have to be forced to watch one whole podcast. You can just watch them separate, especially because I know most of you guys are not fans of the NBA and the NFL. Which is unfortunate because those are great sports and organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and no, we're not talking about baseball. I don't, don't think we're ever going to talk about hockey. I don't I don't even know what hockey is doing right now. Uh, soccer, I'm out of touch in. Alan could probably talk about it for like a minute. And yeah, let's, let's stick with the rest of the game. Maybe. Yeah. So anyways, yeah. in the world of the WWE, it turns out that John Cena, his major injury that we all thought was serious, is just a bruised heel and that he's okay to go and, you know, it's John Cena time. So but what are they going to do with John Cena right now? Because they kind of like at the end of Monday Night Raw looked like they kind of ridden him, ridden him off like he's going to be out for a while. Do you think like they're going to continue on with the injury angle with him as kayfabe? Or you feel like he's just going to come back and he's going to look better than ever? The thing with Cena is, is why are they still making him out to be some kind of underdog? Like, is that, that such an objective for them? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like he's been here for 11 years now. And for those that know, I was at WrestleMania. I know it's kind of weeks now, but. Many people are disappointed in turning out. I, I expect it because, you know, if you watch a Raw Mind, it'll be good to make a wish. He's just, right now, Cena's going to be a face, and nothing's going to change. When he even turned with The Rock, sure, I was disappointed, and Mania was predictable as hell, but, you know, Cena does stuff like that, and he's going to be a face, so he's got to do it. Yeah, it, it, it was just kind of like, I don't know what they were doing. Like, I understand with the Shield, like, I, I thought what they did with the Shield at the end was awesome. But then it was just like Ryback's just kind of looking at them, and he's just like, "Oh, what what are we gonna do here? Like, what's the point of turning Ryback heel? I mean, if he doesn't win this match, it's pretty much like, like, like you pretty much turn Ryback heel for one match, and then you're gonna just turn him face again later on to, down the road. That's why I don't like about this feud. I wish Ryback will win the title, but how much chance are you giving Ryback winning the title? Man, I like to give him some momentum, but. 10%. I'm still questioning. Look, we both love Mark Henry. Yeah. Right? We both love him, but I still have no idea why he went over on Mania against Ryback. Ryback's on a pretty significant losing streak, even though losses kind of don't matter in you know, the crazy world of wrestling. Yeah. It, yeah. And then it's kind of like Mark Henry comes out after WrestleMania. He's like, hey, Cena, I want to challenge you. And so I was like, okay, that makes sense for a feud for Cena. I mean, keep Ryback and Cena away, maybe till a SummerSlam. You have Cena feud with Mark Henry for a little bit. That's fine with me. And then afterwards, they're just kind of like, oh, no, here's Ryback. And it's like, why should Mark Henry take that from Ryback? Why is why is Mark Henry pissed off at Sheamus? Why in the blue book is he not pissed off at Ryback for coming out and beating up Mark Henry in a big-time match? Okay? That right there makes no sense to me. Mark Henry should not even care what John Cena is, uh, what Sheamus is doing. He should be going out there demanding his WWE title match. I mean, it's not like Cena, like if Cena were to feud with Henry, it's not like it would be the main event of the pay per view. Yeah. You know, it's going to, your favorite wrestler is the uh, main event of the pay per view with uh, Brock Lesnar. Yeah, Brock Lesnar and Triple H are going to be main eventing the pay per view instead. So it doesn't even matter. It's just like, 
it's not a main event match. I mean, you have Brock Lesnar and Triple H in the main event. And then afterwards, you also have Ziggler, Swagger, and uh, Del Rio, which... I a think ladder match. It's a ladder match now? Yeah, they picked a stipulation, which should be pretty exciting. You know, I think Del Rio, he's had some really fun matches. Well, Del, Del Rio knows how to work. Like, he works really hard. So does Ziggler. Swagger's just an odd man out. But in the feud sense, it's more like it's... I feel like it's Swagger versus Del Rio. And that Ziggler was just thrown in. And that's kind of bad for the World Heavyweight Champion for me to feel like he's just thrown into this feud. It's a good point. Jeez, yeah. Yeah, I think the momentum with Ziggler, look, I think we're all, most of us are happy that he's champion. Yeah, I'm happy. I just don't see it as a big impact yet. I don't know why. But I guess, you know, give it time, whatever. And yeah. Like, even on SmackDown, like, he hasn't, I don't think he's made a man in one SmackDown. It's been all, like, Shield and whatever. Yeah, it's been all Shield, Sheamus, Randy Orton, Ryback. Like, all these different guys. Not not Ziggler, though. I've got, come on, man. you got to get Ziggler into the main event. My question is, who's Ziggler going to feud with after this? Are they going to continue with Del Rio? Are they going to maybe push someone up to face Ziggler? Maybe Kofi Kingston? Uh, I don't even know who they're going to uh, use. I, I don't Kofi even know. Kofi Kingston's keeping that title warm for uh, Fandango. Uh, I think he's keeping it warm for Big E Langston. Oh, that's a... Hey, that's another good point. Yeah, because AJ's fighting for the Divas title. They're going to have to, like, want to put Big E Langston with the singles title so everyone could be like, oh, my God, Dolph Ziggler's faction, greatest faction I still, ever. I still hate that fact. I still think Ziggler should be a face. And yes. Honestly, I, I want to try to like Big E Langston because I hear he's a really funny guy outside of the ring. I hear he's a good guy and his NXT stuff is pretty insane. But dude, when I look at him, I think... Bobby Lashley combined with old school Taz. You yeah. Know, the singlet and the arms crossed. Yeah, I agree. And then he walks down to the ring. He doesn't really do in anything interesting. I, I also feel Biggie Langston is ruined because we don't have a enough good enough jobbers people care about. It's not like Funaki's can come out there and we'll be pissed off that you're beating up Funaki. Like, when he beats up Zack Ryder, half of us are like, yeah, you're doing a fucking good service to America. Get that idiot off my TV. Like, but we we don't hate him, nor do we want to cheer for him. He's just doing one good thing for us or one bad thing. It's not like we're going to say, I hate Big E Langston forever. I mean, when you debut someone and the first thing they do is beat up John Cena, half of us are not going to really care. Or like the internet fans, we're just going to be like, good, John Cena got his ass kicked, but I don't really care about this guy. Who is he? Like, you know, that debuted, you know, uh, this guy, you know, debuted on Raw and beat up Cena, Mason Ryan. Look how that ended. There, there's a good point. Mason Ryan did debut and beat up Raw, beat, beat up John Cena. And it's like, where, where's Batista 2.0 now? I mean, he's kind of out. He's kind of like out the door, pretty much. He, his, it's not even one foot out the door. It's like his whole body, but one leg is in the door right now, and that one leg needs to be pushed out. One tricep, maybe. Yeah, probably one tricep. That That's smaller. I agree. Because Mason Ryan is not even showing up. What else is going on in the world of wrestling? Uh, Miz is coming back from filming a ABC Family movie. I, I agree. See, I really, at times, I really feel bad for this. I really think the gun should be over more. Like, a lot of people can't stand the men. I just don't understand why. Like, yeah. sure, get the face turn has been forced, but... The guy's so charismatic, but you know why I don't feel bad for him? He's kind of married to Maurice and... Wait, they got, they got, they tied the knot? Like, fucking, fuck you, Miz, I hate you. You're, you're the <laughs> second hatest man in professional wrestling next to Trish Stratus's husband. Oh, man, why well, was that the whole thing? And I, I kind of felt bad when he was getting booed, to be honest. She's like, oh, be nice to my husband. I'm like, Trish, no one's going to be nice to your fucking husband. We're all jealous. We want you, Trish. We're in New York. He was in New York. These wrestling fans they don't care. But, uh, All right. So what, what, what other big news? Um, Intercontinental Champion Wade Barrett does nothing on Raw once again. Um, yes. Antonio Cesaro is still yodeling. Randy Orton cut probably the weirdest promo I've ever heard in my life and then RKO'd Cody for no reason. Well, at least he remembered his line this time. Yep. It, it was, well, Matt Ryan was probably, uh, not Matt Ryan, Matt, uh, what's his fucking sick face? Striker was there. He was just like, he, he probably, he's probably was whispering in Orton's ear as we speak. He was like probably whispering. Matt Striker has those skills. He has those TV skills. Yeah. Like, we're both Orton fans, but she, that, uh, 
Honestly, I mean, you're was he a ten year veteran? How can you do such a thing that blatant? Yeah. I just think he cares anymore. Yeah, someone was telling me like Oh, yeah, I'll, anyone who goes to the, like, someone was asking me, it was just a random Skype conversation, he's like, who do you think of everyone in WWE would go to TNA? And I said, oh, if I was Randy Orton, I would ask for the first stop to TNA. And he asked me why. And I'm like, well, just think about this. In 2004, probably almost 10 years ago, in 2004, you came into the company, no, 2002, you came into the company, you were injured, but in 2003, you got a huge push. You won the IC title. You're beating guys by the name of like Shawn Michaels, Rob Van Dam, Booker T. Like you're, you're beating these type of guys. You enter 2004, and you become the youngest world heavyweight champion ever, ever. And then after that, you only hold that title for a month, and then you're stuck doing whatever the fuck WWE wants you to do for three years before you finally win another major title. And pretty much, you just are your other major titles don't mean anything because your first major title didn't even last that long. So, no one really cares about you. John Cena, who won his title a year later, and same with Batista, are more popular than you. I mean, if I was Randy Orton, I would kind of be like, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. You guys didn't use me right throughout the years. I'm still young. I'm going to go to TNA, and TNA is going to use me right. You know, I won't go to TNA, though, because. WWE's paying him a nice fat check every. I, I heard, I yeah, I, I heard something crazy. It was like when he was suspended, like that one time, and everyone was just like freaking out, and everyone thought like it was over. I heard like Randy Orton had enough money in his bank for like two years to just not do anything. Just imagine that, people. You had enough money in your bank in two years not to do anything. And he, you know, he's coming out with that big uh, motion picture, right? Uh, oh rounds. yeah. yeah. 12 rounds, who am I talking to so I can kick your ass or when oh. I see <laughs> Like, what the fuck is this? It's that so crazy, because I remember, like, 2009, everybody loved Dorn. I think the day uh, people started turning on Dorn was, ironically, when uh, Christian won the title, which is the two-year anniversary, it's saying. I'm a huge Christian fan, so I know that. But, yeah, I think when Orton mm -hmm. beat Christian, the internet kind of turned on him. And it hasn't been the same since. Yeah, no, I, I agree because it was like kind of like, because like Christian was just like, you know, they had that moment. Like fucking Christian was up there. He had the title. Edge was there. You thought, wow, this is really great for WWE. I love Captain Charisma. And then all of a sudden RKO. And then it's just like one, two, three. Christian's no longer champion. And then he wins the title again because Orton kicked him in the fucking balls. I mean, when you're, if you're Christian at that point, you're kind of just like, why? Why do I care? Yeah, it's like that pay per view was so good though. I was like, oh, oh okay, which right, one? Christian. Extreme Rules? Like, yeah, Extreme Rules was really good. No, that and Money in the Bank. Oh yeah, those pay per views were really good. But uh, yeah, it's, in terms of wrestling right now, it just seems like like the writers that write these roles are just going through the motions. They're just mm -hmm. thinking of new like dumb challenges to do. They're jobbing out the same people every week. Cesaro, Cody Rhodes, and even Kofi at times. It just seems so like a daze. So that's why I struggle to get through rosters. Yeah, dude, like, it, you, pop, you feel like these rosters are supposed to be so big. Like, there's so many talented guys on these rosters. And then later on, half of them are on fucking superstars. And then you see the same bunch of, like, 15 people on Raw. And you're like, what the hell? The one thing I think we should go get praise to, uh, I know it was only for a week, but I absolutely loved Hager in both of his appearances. I was, I really, I thought the match with Ambrose and Samantha was whatever, you know, kind of generic, but just his presence, man. I absolutely loved his Taker, and that match in England was really fun. Yep, and the reason why Undertaker came back, a lot of people were kind of confused, was most people don't know because Undertaker pretty much is going to be done after WrestleMania 30. That that seems like it. that's true. Uh, he wanted to wrestle his final year in Europe, and he wanted to pay respect for He even did house shows, too. I heard that he did a couple house shows. Uh, see, that's what Taker does. He's a great guy. So that's why he was on Raw. That's why he was on SmackDown. And he's actually, they actually might bring him back for SummerSlam this year to feud, to feud with the Shield. And then WrestleMania 30, the biggest opponent that's number one on their list, and it's finally going to happen, which makes the biggest sense to me, is John Cena. So, yeah. 
We have Cena and Undertaker hopefully on deck. That's going to be the main event. Rock versus Brock Lesnar most likely will happen at WrestleMania 30. Triple H will probably fight like, I don't know, like Shawn Michaels somehow. They, they, they'll get a match together. Um, and then CM Punk will probably be facing like, I don't know, maybe Daniel Bryan in a 60-minute Iron Man match with a WWE title. Then we will get Dolph Ziggler like doing nothing. Then we'll get like Batista coming back somehow. <laughs> hey, he tweeted on Twitter. He tweeted on Twitter. He squashed rumors today. Oh, uh, really? He did? What a fucking asshole. Was he just he joking said, around? He's doing another big movie, yeah. Oh, well, hey. Yeah, he, he stays away from the octagon. I'm happy. Yeah, well, he, they're, they're, his, his, his clothes, he, he, he's done with that, okay? His... That was deplorable, but uh, in terms of extreme rules, though, I think it's actually going to be an all right pay per view. Yeah. I just, I don't know, Lesnar, Triple H, man. I feel like, I, I feel like with the Steel Cage match, it's going to be better because they don't have the force to like, because they don't have time to go out there and just lay there. They're going to be in a Steel Cage. They're going to play out the fact Brock Lesnar was a UFC fighter and we're going to see a lot of like boring clinches in the match, but it doesn't even matter because I feel like they're just going to do a pretty better job with the Steel Cage than they would have with the No Holds Barred match. The whole barred matches were boring with these two. I feel like they can do a better job with the steel cage. I don't even know what Cena and Ryback is, but what what the fuck is their stipulation? Well, it's extreme rules, so there's definitely gonna be some kind of there's gonna be weapons. It's gotta be, because I don't think they can get through it just straight so Yeah, because okay, see, cause I don't know if it's gonna be like Cena rules where pretty much it's an I quit match and I think it's too early for an I quit match because that's a save for over D limit I don't even know if that pay-per-view is still around. I don't know if it's gonna be a chair match I don't know if it's gonna be like a Last man standing maybe Well uh, faces always win in last man standing. It's pretty rare to see heel win a last man standing. Yeah, the only and, and then uh, The only way I see them doing it is if they go all out Royal Rumble 2004 where like it becomes a draw. Like I can't see them doing a last man standing match where Cena loses. Or I, I, I wouldn't mind a last man standing, but I just don't see how they can do it where one of them does not get ultimately hurt. So they have to do a draw because if Ryback does not go down, eh. right? If Ryback doesn't like get up and he loses to Cena, that's stupid. They're just gonna kill him. They're just going to kill them. And I started liking Ryan Beck over the past few months. You know, at first I was really skeptical of him being pushed to me, but I kind of enjoyed, like, his work. But his interaction with Mick Foy was pretty brutal to watch. I was like, oh, boy, this guy needs, like, he needs a mouthpiece. Go go hire him. Mar- I, I'm telling you, he, if he was undefeated still, hire Floyd Money Mayweather. Mayweather would promote the fuck out of Ryback. And if you want to turn him heel, too, have Mayweather next to him. Mayweather will annoy the fuck out of the fans. He loves the professional wrestling business. Like, he watches Raw every week. Don't know why. He he thinks it's, like, the greatest TV ever, if you ask him that. Like, Floyd Mayweather will promote the fuck out of Ryback. You just have money, Mayweather. He has the Mayweather team on his on his shoulder. You know, you have Mayweather come out and support him in the, in the championship fights that Mayweather's in. You just have money, Mayweather. Like, who's going to fuck with Ryback? Like, Mayweather's undefeated and Ryback's undefeated. It works perfectly, but, eh, whatever. Maybe, maybe that just makes too much sense for WWE. <laughs> Time on to Impact Wrestling. Oh, boy. Brother, it, brother, brother. All over again? I know it's the running joke, but I got to ask you. Is it 1997 all over again? Pretty much. Um, AJ Styles playing the role of Sting. Like, I, I need, like, that Family Matters theme song for this. It's like, you have that playing in the background, and it just shows AJ Styles as Sting, and then later on it shows Bully Ray as Hulk Hogan, <laughs> Devon Dudley as Scott Hall, and then it, um, Luke Gallows as Kevin Ash. <laughs> Like, in the summer, man, I would really enjoy talking about TNA for, like, an hour or so. Now, I only want to talk about it more than, like, ten minutes. It's just, wow, has the product really been destroyed, man? It, it, it's just that TNA, like I always say, they don't know what to do after Bound for Glory. After Bound for Glory, they're pretty much stuck in a rut. And then after Slammiversary, and Slammiversary ends up always being, like, a either a great show or a really bad show. It's like, after Slammiversary, TNA is like, all right, guys, let's do a good job. And then they do good for, like, the next four months. And then you're like, wait, 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 hold up, hold up. 
You mean I was actually watching this shit? How in the blue fuck did it go become better and bad? Like they were, they were using their actual talent, man. You know, you get Aries and Rude being the best here. Now Aries and Rude are just sidemen. Like, See, the thing the thing about just... Aries and Rude, I kind of like that they're because like this is what WWE at least doesn't do with their main eventers. Aries and Rude are getting broken down. So which which is good because get them out of the main event. We saw them last year. Like I would rather see like a James Storm move up there now, and, and so that way we don't always have to have Rude and Storm. Like we can just have Aries and Rude be in the tag team division. That's like breaking down and building up. That's fine with me if they're in the tag team division. But what's not fine with me is that we're not getting anyone else. Like it, it's clear as obvious as day. You cannot convince me if you're fucking gonna try to convince me this will not happen at Battle for Glory. You are a fucking moron. You don't know professional wrestling and don't talk to me. AJ Styles bully ready for the TNA World Championship at Bound for Glory. It is going to happen. All you people who deny that, you are wrong. AJ Styles and Bully Ray will have a match, at least at Bound for Glory, with TNA versus Aces and Eights. You cannot deny that. Are, are you, anything, anything better than Hogan. Anything, or, you know, well, they're going to have to get Sting out of the way, but I can see that happening. But, uh, I don't, know, don't you get the feeling that Hogan's going to somehow get involved? Oh, oh, no, Ho yes, oh, oh, Hulk Hogan's going to be the main force, I mean, this is how the conversation is going to go, listen here, brother, AJ, dude, I know that you have had the demons in your past, brother, and let me tell you something, brother, I have demons too, dude, I have demons too, my wife left me, my wife does not know what she's missing, brother, looking at the Hulkamania dick, but it doesn't even matter, dude, AJ, let me tell you something, brother, you gotta join Team TNA. You gotta do it, AJ. Stop the Aces and Eights before it hurts you, me, and everyone else in this company, brother. And then everyone's just gonna be like, AJ, AJ. And then later on, Hulk Hogan will say, like, AJ Mania's running wild. And then everyone's gonna be like, yeah! And AJ's gonna be like, yeah. And then afterwards... Just, just, they killed all the baby faces right now. They killed Storm. They killed Joe. They killed Magnus. They killed whoever else. It's like right now, doing Sting and they're pushing Matt Morgan for the 19th time. That's lovely. And it's just, all the, where is the baby face? And that's why, like, I told him, like, why did they turn off Scenario's heel? The guy had so much momentum. The crowd was on his side. And all they used them is for, as a stepping stone for Joe Carson. Well, well the, that, the, you said the guy's name right there. That's why, Jeff Hardy. Because they know that Jeff Hardy makes little girls' vaginas wet. Moms just love him for some reason. Dads are like, oh, he's kind of cool. And little kids are like, I want to jump off rooftops. So, like, he like Jeff Hardy. So, you know, that's why. Because Jeff Hardy is like, Jeff Hardy. I'm going to turn Aries' face by the back right now. I don't understand. What's the what are you expecting to get out of Sting or his Bully Ray headline a pay per view and they only show four pay per views a year? It's just Sting for me, Bully for, Ray. for me personally, it's like I keep over over triple digits. For me personally, Slammiversary should have been Bully Ray versus Hulk Hogan. I would have rather wanted that because it makes more sense for Hulk Hogan. Why is Sting getting involved with the Hogan family? That that's why. See, AJ Styles and Bully Ray, it's going to be the big match at Battle for Glory. I mean, because, like, okay, if, if I was a little kid and I was seeing AJ Styles come out with, like, you know, a beard, a fucking leather jacket, a hoodie over his head, you know, with jeans on, I would probably think AJ's, like, the biggest badass ever. Like, that that's the thing about AJ Styles. AJ Styles looks kind of like a badass right now in a way. I mean, most guys kind of, like, let themselves go anyways most of the time. Style doesn't really matter to some guys. But what I like about AJ Styles is just like they're hitting the nail on the head with him. You know, he's not really a heel, but he's not really a babyface either. Like he won't be with uh what what's uh Kaz and Daniel's official tag name? I always forget their name. I always think it's back to basics. Bad influence. Bad influence. Where, where do I get back to basics? I always think they're uh, something else like he's not aligning with bad influence, but he's not aligning with James Storm. Like they're doing a really good job making AJ into a tweener, and I wish that was Ryback right there. I wish Ryback would help. You know, on that one Raw at the end where he helped like John Cena, where he helped the Shield beat up John Cena, and then afterwards he just hits the Shield for no reason. And everyone's like, "Dude, what what is he doing?" And then it's just kind of like you either get the you either want to cheer this man or you either want to boo this man. That that's what they're doing well 
with a tweener in the WWE. Like, I hated when people were like, CM Punk is a tweener. No, CM Punk, not a tweener. Tweener means that he attacks heels or faces, and he doesn't give a shit. Tweener, he not. I told people, he's not a tweener. CM Punk was never a tweener throughout his career. He's always been a clean baby face or a clean heel. And when he turned 2011, everyone thought he was a, a, a tweener. No, when you're feuding with God, you are baby face. God makes people into baby faces. Triple H does that. The only tweener like that was pretty evident through his career was probably Kane. Yeah, Kane, Kane, Kane's a big tweener. Kane was a huge tweener because you didn't know what Kane would do. He would either come out, choke slam like your favorite to rock, and you're like, why would you do that, Kane? And then he would just come back and choke slam Triple H, and then you're like, I love you, Kane. And that, that's what I'm talking about because that's what AJ Styles is doing right now. And this is why it works really good as an angle, because we don't know where his head is at. We're just kind of like sitting there as the audience being like, so why did he do that? I thought he liked bad influence. Yeah. Where else could they go with this? Um, they have so much like talent, but it's just, like you're not using the, I don't want to say youth, because I don't use, but you, like guys in their prime, and you're just wasting it still every year. Sting is still you know being used. And that's what the icon does. It's showtime, baby. I mean, I hey, put Kurt Angle in there. Yeah, I, I don't even know what Kurt Angle's doing. I think he's like too busy stalking girls at coffee shops or something. I don't know. He's doing something. Well, you know, Kurt Angle's made a lot of bad decisions in the past five years, but I do like how he's like, you know, kind of like, you, you know, giving the young guys as bad as they are, you know, Briscoe for shows. You know, they're kind of. Kind of giving us some influence right there. I mean, he's working with them, so mm -hmm. it's not totally obvious. Man. Yeah, no, he he, yeah, he isn't. He he really isn't. But other for T, uh, other things for TNA, I'm not really that excited for Slammiversary because there's no because once again there's no King of the Mountain match, so it's hard to get excited for a show where one one match a year I always used to get excited for. Now I don't even get to see it anymore. So, what was that? Well, I think 2009 was the last year. Adam, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I don't even get. I, I usually get super excited. For, yeah, I didn't care that it was a stupid gimmick match. I just loved the concept. It was like, you know, when people get excited for like a certain WWE pay per view because of the concept, like Money in the Bank. You know that that's what came the Mountain was. It was a it was a dumb idea, but it was a really great concept. It was something that was like unique to TNA. So I was just kind of like so upset when they got rid of it. I think that night Joe turned right and his career kind of went down the drain. Yeah, was it that night? I I, I was Joe, Joe joined the mafia. I think that was another time. I think that was another. Uh, yeah, I think that maybe was. I thought the last one was when Joe. No, Joe was the yeah Joe turned. That was the last one I believe. And, and his career hasn't recovered, but uh, it's very unfortunate. But uh, I thought in terms of like TNA gig matches, like. They should drop Lethal Lockdown. That was just a mess this year. No, oh, God. I didn't find the X Division cage matches. What do they call that? Escape. X. Escape. <laughs> Other than Homicide, really botching that one. So I, those matches were kind of cool. Yeah. No, see, that was the one thing that always, like, like what I hate when people would bash TNA, like, back in the past, I was just, they were like, TNA's so stupid. They don't think of anything original. I'm like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, let's hold on. I'm like, yes, TNA doesn't think of anything original, but at least they have fun little gimmick matches like the Ultimate X, the Elevation X, Xscape, you know, King of the Mountain. Like, I'll just tell people, like, yeah, TNA is not really the most original thing out there, but at least they have fun little gimmick matches. Like, Ultimate X, like, a lot of people love the Ultimate X matches. Those, those are fun little spot fest matches to watch, but... Uh, TNA needs to really step up their game, but we'll, but we're pretty much done with TNA and professional wrestling for this portion of the podcast. For all so for all you wrestling fans, you guys can leave, okay? Unless you guys are MMA fans too, because we're gonna talk about um, reset MMA events. Well, probably just the two that are coming up this month: Luke Rockhold, former Strike Force champion, taking on the former UFC champion. Vitor Belfort, or Vitor Belfort. I don't know why I said Vitor. It's not like we don't know him. Uh, Vitor <laughs> Belfort. Boy, the card for this one for a free little Brazilian card. Yes, this is in Jaraguá de Sol, Brazil. And 
The card besides that is Rafael Nato versus Chris Camuzzi, which is kind of just like a eh type of card, uh, type of match. It's not really a fight that I'm really looking forward to. You have Rafael Dos Anjos versus Evan Dunham. And this, I was trying to wonder where the fuck is Evan Dunham. But well, what has he been yeah, doing? I mean, the last time I saw this guy on TV, let's see. Last time I saw this guy on TV. Wow, yeah, he's actually been actually fighting. I was just like trying to figure him out. Like, where where is this guy? Yeah, the last time I saw this guy on TV, he lost to Melvin Gillard on UFC Fight for the Troops too. Now, guys, that was in 2011. After that, I did not know where the hell this fucker was. I would say maybe he was on the prelims when you see him, but sheesh. I was just like, where's Evan Dunham? He's like a ghost. I mean, he's pale as hell, so he is a ghost. But I was like, where the fuck is this guy? But he's facing Rafael Dos Anjos. Uh, that fight should be pretty solid. I don't think it's going to be any. I think Rafael Dos Anjos just got on the card because they're like, oh, we need uh, more Brazilians on the card so people can watch the show and the Brazilians could be so happy. So go. <laughs> and so that's pretty much what they did. And then pretty much they got one of the Team Black House members, former Strike Force middleweight champion, uh, Ronald Sozoa. So, 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 I can never pronounce his name, but he's a former Strike Force goddamn champion, okay? That's all you really need to know about this guy. Um, he, he, he lost the Strike Force title to Luke Rockhold. He, I believe he trains with Team Black House. Uh, I know he trains with Jacare, and where is Jacare? Where, where the fuck is Jacare out of all is these? Is he supposed to fight Costa Filippo? No, no, that's Ronald Sazuo. He, he's fighting him. Or is that? Or maybe that is Jacare's. Uh, maybe that's his nickname. I thought Jacare was his last name. I'll, I'll try looking up right now. But I thought it was Jacare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his. That's his nickname, Jacare. I, I didn't know that was Ronald. So I was just calling him Ronaldo Jacare or someone Jacare. Yes, Jacare is fighting on the card against Costa Philippou. It's a pretty fun fight. Yeah, that's going to be a good fight. I, I didn't know this was, uh, like, I knew, I never knew his full name, okay? I just always thought, like, there. I knew, like, Strike Force had a bunch of Brazilians, and so I had Sozua and Jacare, and so I never put the two to two together. Where, where the fuck is his teammate? Like, he had another guy in Strike Force that was, like, one of these little Brazilians. Uh, I remember it was, like, Jacare and someone else, but... On the FX poster, it says Jacare, I noticed. No, it does? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, for, for now on, it's no longer, right, your name is no longer Ronaldo Sozua. It's just Jacare. Yeah, it's pretty sad. But yeah, that's a pretty fun uh, FX card. I think it's better than the one, the last one. No. Uh, which is the before Bisping, but. Yeah, and then Vitor versus Loke Rocco. I, I like that fight. That's going to be a fun fight. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a really huge test for Rockhold. You know, I think UFC really, other than Cormier, I don't think there's other, any other strike force guy mm -hmm. getting that huge of a match. Uh, here. Yeah, Gay, Gayhard yeah, Musasi had, had some sort of a big match. He was going to with, uh, fuck, what, what, who's the guy with the it's Swedish Gufferson. guy? Gufferson. Yeah, Gufferson. He was going to face Gufferson. and But then afterwards, they were just kind of like, you know, Gufferson got injured, and then they had to face him against some random fuck. So, yeah, but the last time anyone saw Luke Rockhold in the... Oh, God. The last time Luke Rockhold was in the ring, he fought against the most useless, pathetic piece of shit in the world, um, Tim Kennedy. Yeah, I don't like Tim Kennedy, and I don't care that... I know that what he did in the war was great and all, but after that last fight, I lost all respect for Tim Kennedy. He looked pathetic against Luke Rockhold. Uh, Luke Rockhold, I, I, I would actually like to see him beat Vitor, because I think that, I don't think he can beat Anderson, but I think that he can do well in the, in the middleweight division of the UFC. Vitor is just so dangerous, man. It's really hard to pick against Vitor. Yeah, I know, because like Vitor, you're like, eh, hey, he's old, washed up, and then all of a sudden he comes back and he just, he goes to the middle of the ring and he starts beating the shit out of someone with his crazy haymakers, and you're like, oh, um, can I change my bet? He's just vicious. Speaking of Tim Kennedy, he's actually, you know, he, he got caught up to the UFC. Oh, God. I hope he's, he loses. Uh, he's, uh, he's fighting on what, UFC 162. That's the Wyman Silver card. He's the main event of the prelims. He's facing on uh, Roger Gracie. 
And Roger Gracie, you better break his butt, break something, so he cannot return ever. <laughs> that's, that's a strike versus a strike force. Yeah, Roger Gracie versus Tim Kennedy. Strike force for life. That's what Dana White's thinking. In other news, the WEC still has a better record against UFC fighters. And now they have a better record against Strike Force fighters. There we go. Nice. Benson okay. Henderson broke the series tie. It was 1 0. It was 0 0 at first. And then Benson Henderson came in and said, WEC for life. And then Strike Force lost. So Strike Force right now is losing the fight. So WEC showing that they're very dominant when it came down to talent. Well, the big news was announced that uh, Charles Sonnen is not retiring, which I'm, I'm actually kind of happy about. Well, what is he doing now? Is he going to go move down to lightweight? No, he said he's staying at 205, but he's kind of going to do like the Rich Franklin thing. I'm kind of just, you know, being around like, you know, like cash weight. And he says he wants to sell his differences with uh, Wanderlei. Well, at least he will fight people. I mean, it's not like he's not going to be like. He's going to be the main event. Yeah, he he. At least he will now promote like other cards. I mean, that would be good. He can just like make fun of like Vanderlei Silva's music or something. I don't know. He'll, he'll find something to make fun of. But moving on forward, we got UFC 160 here. Um, Donald Cerrone taking on KJ fucking Noon. I, Cerrone, I I got very good feeling Cerrone is gonna bounce back and KO him. I hate KJ Nunes. Uh, the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. When KJ Nunes won a fight against some random fuck, he was all like, uh, I want to do boxing versus MMA. I feel like I'm a good representative. And I want to fight Floyd Mayweather. Uh. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You're an idiot. And he's lost his last two fights. He lost to uh, Josh Thompson and uh, Ryan Couture, so. Oh, he lost to Ryan. Wait, him. he lost a Wow, he did lose to Couture. Oh, wow. Damn. Uh, KJ Nunes, you better step it up. When you're losing to Ryan Couture, um, that's when you have some problems in your fighting career. But it I, I was a split decision, but still. Even then, it's Ryan Couture. It's yeah. I, I don't know that that's a crazy fight. Like, what is Ryan Couture even doing? Is is he with Bellator? No, he fought in the UFC. He was on the Sweden card. Uh, he got knocked out by uh, Ross Pearson. Yeah. So Ross Pearson did us good justice in this world, but wait a minute. So like, I'm confused. Like, why did Randy Couture go to Bellator again? Why, why did he? Sign a contract with Bellator. Were they just offering more money? I think Dana just don't get along. But, I, but money had to play a factor, though. Because there's a bunch of people, you know. Look at guys like Matt Hughes. They have, like, a big role now in the UFC and kind of like a management role, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. uh, I think money had to play into it. So, yeah, because I was, like, trying to wonder, like, okay, maybe that, that's the reason why he went to Bellator. Because the UFC is like, you're not talented, Ryan Couture. You can't fight here. And then Bellator's just like, we'll take anyone because we're desperate. So He was in the co-main event, too. He was uh, co-main with that Gustafson, uh, well, you know, Gustafson didn't fight, but, you know, Lusasi Gustafson fight. Oh, okay. I only saw that, because, I, I, like, you know how that fight came on at a uh, different time? It came on, like, at a late, it, it, like, in American time, somewhere different. I didn't oh. know what, what time it started, so I just, like, messed most of the card. Uh, what's going on in the world of Bellator before we continue on with the UFC 160 card? Because there's a lot going on in that card, but I want to know what's going on in the world of Bellator. Anyone know? I watch it sparingly, and I do think Michael Chandler has a future. And I, I mm -hmm. watched him play a few times. He's talented. I'm still waiting for Eddie Alvarez to finally come here. He's like the, I think he's yes. like the new guy. Everyone's just waiting for him to come here. And uh, King Mo, I don't know. He got knocked out pretty bad. Man, that was a Honestly, knockout of the year so far it should be that. From the guy's name, whoever the guy who knocked out King Mo, he should have knockout of the year. Yeah. Um. So the upcoming championship fights, I'm on Bellator's main website. We got Daniel Strauss taking on Pat Curran. I like Pat Curran. He's a pretty solid fighter for the featherweight world championship. Um. 
Welterweight World Championship, Andre Korosov, Kor Korskov, I think that's how you pronounce it, 13-0, taking on Ben Askren. Then you got Doug Marshall taking on Alexander Shadlamenko. None of you guys are going to ever beat Anderson Silva for the middleweight championship. <laughs> and our light heavyweight championship, and none of you bucks are going to beat John Jones. Um, Emmanuel Newton and Antila Bay. Yeah, it lo looks interesting, some of the title fights they have there. I might want to check those out in the near future when they come. You know, you know who got released it in the UFC? Who? Uh, Chuck Congo. No, not Chuck Congo. Come on. He, he has the most UFC heavyweight fights of all time. You mean the most boring heavyweight? But <laughs> still the most. It's Chick Congo. He's like a trademark. When You know it's going to be a UFC show when you see Chick Congo on the car. You're like, yeah. I mean, Chick Congo has been part of historic UFC shows. I kind of predicted it, because, you know, I if you look at his past fights, he's got well, well, destroyed by Mark Hunt. I, I feel they should still keep Chicago around as an ambassador, because, like, he's one of the he's one of those main players that came from Fran France. Like, he's one of the first people that made, you know, Fran French fighters want to fight. I mean, well, I, I, I feel that he should still work. They, offer, they actually offered him a four-fight contract, and he declined, which... So they didn't straight out release and they just, you know, they just uh, said, all right. Oh, oh, okay. That makes more sense. Because I, I think the UFC has more respect for Chick Congo than just saying, yeah, sorry, buddy. We're going to release you now. Because I, I always thought they were on good terms with Chick Congo. I think if any fighter that Dana White never has a problem with, it's Chick Congo. Yeah. I think Congo has more leeway compared to, like, you know, a John Fitch. Who yeah. Was... Oh, most definitely. Especially how long Congo's been there. Mm hmm yeah, Moses. Moses. I don't know, he's 37. I don't know what future he has left. Yeah, he's pro probably, that's why. He probably just wants to be done. I mean, he probably has a lot of money in the bank from all his fights, so good for him. You know, Chick Congo. Oh, did you hear about what Anderson Silva did? He, well, he asked for a super fight. Yes. Right? Again, after Weidman, it's going to be Silva versus Jones once Jones heals up. And this is actually perfect timing for Dana White because Dana still has no New York cleared in 2013. So it's hoping to be pushed to 2014. Uh, GSP said that pretty much he does not want to fight Anderson Silva because he does not want to move up to 185. Uh, mainly because Silva weighs in at 230 and he walks around at 190. It says it will be unfair and wants Silva to come down to him. So GSP, just come out and say it. You're afraid to face Anderson Silva. You're afraid because you know after that Matt Sarah fight, your whole career has pretty much been, been you know, broken mirrors, smoking mirrors pretty much. Your career has been smoking mirrors because all you do, GSP, is this. Oh, I'm facing bad wrestler, but he's a better striker than me. I'm just going to take him down and wrestle. Oh, I'm facing bad striker, but he's a better wrestler than me. All I'm going to do is outstrike him. I mean, that's pretty much what you do. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, what about Nick Diaz? Nick Diaz is not a good wrestler. He's a good jiu-jitsu fighter, but not a good wrestler. There's a difference. Just because you do jiu-jitsu does not mean you do wrestling. Totally different um, forms of thought. But that's all GSP does. And he knows if he faces Anderson Silva, his only chance is to lay and prey on Silva. But look at what happened to Chael Sonnen when he was doing that. Well, Chael Sonnen wasn't really doing lay and pray, but you get the idea. I mean, look at what happened to Chael Sonnen. He got choked out. I mean, he's just afraid to face Anderson Silva because GSP knows he's pretty much going to lose against Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva, he, he just wants the UFC fans to get what they want. He knows that we want to see a super fight, and he's willing to, even if he loses, his career gets gets um tampered. He doesn't give a shit. At least we got a super fight from Silva. Silva's down to fight. I'm down with Silva. Silva, you go fight John Jones, and you give us the fight we want to see. Yeah. Well, I think GSP could still be in a sword fight, you know. Maybe you have to wait another year or so. But I could see him facing uh, Benson. That's a super fight. I agree with that. Like, we, we like pretty much in the UFC, throughout its whole career, when it came down to, like, super fights, we've only really had probably... I would want to say three super fights. I'm not 100% sure fans would agree with me. And the UFC standards, I'm not talking about pride. I'm talking about in the UFC standards. We've only had like three super fights. And those three super fights are BJ Penn versus GSP. That's a super fight. 
Then the other super fight was Randy Couture versus Tim Sylvia. And then the most recently, Frankie Edgar versus Jose Aldo. Okay. So we've only really had like three huge super fights. And uh, BJ Penn and GSP actually fought twice. So technically like kind of like four. And that was like the first time. I, I think that was like one of the first times where the lightweight and the welterweight champions fought each other. So that, that was a pretty cool thing. But for me personally... I, I, I'm down for any super fights. I feel MMA just needs to do super fight out of super fight. Especially with boxing. Your super fight, their one super fight anyone ever cared about is gone. I mean, Mayweather is old as a hell, and he's getting older, and he, he frankly is not, like, the most exciting fighter in the world, Floyd Mayweather. And, and Manny Pacquiao, he's old. He's like, he, he lost his last two fights. No one cares, wants to see that. So... You know, honestly, I'm down with super fights. I'm down with a lot of super fights because super fights are just like those dream cards. Like, they, they know I can give us those dream cards. So, you know what? Give Chael Sonnen one more chance at Anderson Silva. He he did a bad spinning back this. Uh, he needs one more chance. One more chance. I am excited that uh, Chael is playing. Well, not official, but what we, what we know is going on because. I just think Chen was a team fighting. He just fight every Brazilian possible. Yeah, exactly. You know, whether it's Little Nog or maybe Shogun or uh, me towards Austin, our name, or how move the heavyweight. Don't fight Big Nog. No, that's too much. But, uh, hey, remember, I, Big Nog tried to feed a bus of carrot, according to Chan Sonnet. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably my favorite story of all time. Dude, that's just insane. He's like, he's like, I was here when Big Nog and Little Nog came to Vegas, and Little Nog or Big Nog tried to feed it a carrot. I'm like, what? Oh, uh, but enough random MMA talk. We still got a huge fight. Winner gets to fight Benson Henderson. Don't know why, but uh, being, being being dead serious, don't know why. Uh, Gray Maynard, the guy with the tramp stamp. Yeah. Uh, you know Gray Maynard. I had, I had a couple fights with Frankie Edgar, and after that, no one really cared what happened to him. It's taking on TJ Grant. TJ Grant really hasn't beaten anybody. Uh, his, big, his biggest win. His biggest win is like out of that four fight winning streak. His biggest win is like Evan Dunham, Matt Wyman. Um, I'm trying to look at his out of all four of those. Like they're all pretty much on the same level. I mean, he hasn't been really a top ten guy, and Gray Manor, he's been very injury prone, so that's why well, he was so pretty much he beats Clay. Pretty, pretty much, pretty much ever since that TJ Grant has made his lightweight debut, he's just been on a roll pretty much because like he was sucking in the welterweight, so he's pretty much four and zero. Oh, he's pretty much undefeated in the lightweight division. I just, I don't know. I just, to me, like somebody like I think that Josh Thompson has more of a claim to a title shot compared to those two guys. Like Thompson finished Nate Diaz. That's huge. I would give him. A yeah, name. especially since Nate Diaz is a former was the former contender. So yeah. you would and think, Josh right? Josh Thompson made a huge impact. You would I think, think he's getting kind of short sighted, or you know, man, yeah. it's it's, it's a UFC. They do whatever they want, but. It's like, to me personally, I, I, I'm just like, I don't really care who fights Benson Henderson. I don't think any of them deserves a title strike against Benson Henderson. But we're going to get it either way, so it doesn't even matter. I mean, it's going to be... Uh, I guess you like to see Gray in there, but I don't know. TJ Gray has some potential, but he's kind of proven to me. And lightweight division is pretty stacked. Like, Yeah, like, there's a lot of good fighters in that lightweight division. There's a lot, so it's kind of hard to really say that these guys are the number one contenders right off the bat. But I just think so. Where wins better look as good or even better than Josh Thompson? Yeah, I I think James Tahuna can actually win by knockout in the first yeah. round. But other than that, nothing really going for him. I'm I'm not really. Giving him too much of an edge here. I'm not saying like, oh, James Cahoon is going to destroy Gray Maynard because this is going to be his toughest, you know, lightweight fighter that he's going to face off since moving to down to the division. Mm-hmm. And is this even a fight at lightweight? I heard it was like a fight at 160 or something like that. No, I think it's a lightweight fight. Okay. 
So. Uh, next one we got uh, we got Glover to share versus James Tahuna, who is replacing Ryan Bader. And Bader that means first. James Tahuna's game is ass kicked. Yeah, he's in a big spot here. Way too big of a spot for me. Way, way too big of a spot for me. James Tahuna does not deserve a shot against Glover. Yeah. He's on a four-fight winning streak, but still, it's just like a... And just like TJ Grant, he's on a four-fight winning streak against nobodies. Yeah, his biggest win is, I don't know, Ryan Kimmy or... Not Joey Beltran. <laughs> Joey Beltran for the win, bro. Joey Beltran does everything, bro. Mex the execution. I can't say it properly, but I don't know. Glover really needs to impress here, though, because I, you know, he kind of looked lackluster against Rampage. You know, yeah. I think Glover right here needs to make a huge impact. In Glover just needs to come out and do what we thought he was going to do when he came to the UFC: knock everyone out. Well, he has, man. Hit that fight against Fabio Maldonado. That was crazy. I'm just saying, not like destroy. Like we thought he was just going to destroy like almost everyone. Again, like I just want Glover to finally destroy someone, and I think James Tahuna is that victim. So sorry, James Tahuna, rest in peace. Um, okay. You're going to be Glover's victim. You're going to be Glover's first like super duper knockout victim. You need one thing Glover needs to do. He needs to stop fighting like Chuck Liddell. I notice he fights too much like Chuck Liddell. Enough, Glover. Fighting like Chuck Liddell is loser style. Fight your own style. Learn your own style. Don't fight like Chuck Liddell. I mean, that's why Chuck Liddell is too busy going to bars, hating on women, and not doing anything in his life. Okay? That's why you need to get your own fighting style. Don't fight like Chuck Liddell anymore. Enough. You see these light heavyweights, you know, they start making you know, some significant impacts. They're finishing guys off and they're winning big fights. Whoever, you know, he's got to... Still, somehow he's got impressed here to earn another big fight. You know? Yeah, because I'm tired of hearing like, "Oh, Alexander Gustafsson deserves the big fight against John Jones." No, fuck that. I want Gayhard. I want either Gegard or Glover Machida. or Machida get the title shot. Like, I'm not a big Gustafsson fan. I think a lot of people just love Gustafsson just because he has the same like almost amount of reach as John Jones. Like. Gumpston looks pathetic, okay, in my personal opinion, like against John Jones. I think he's going to get his ass kicked against John Jones. I say put him in a number one contest fight Machida and see what he's going to make. Because, you know, when you fight Machida, you're going to know if you're ready or not. Yeah, because I don't even think he's ready for the top tier talent. I think he gets other talent. Yeah, he looks amazing, but I feel like he's like Stephen Struve of the light heavyweight division. He's yeah, a Stephen Struve. Harsh, man. I think that's a little harsh, man. To Struve. At least Guff said he, he's been on a winning streak, you know. Struve, he gets knocked out, you know. I really fight. Seems like he likes to step in Struve in a way. Like he's just tall, he lanky. Like, like they're kind of he's kind of stepping Struve ish. But I, I I hope Glover just knocks the hell out of James Tahuna. I don't hate James Tahuna. I just want Glover to look good so not, so I can stop hearing about Alexander Gustafsson deserving the number one contender title shot. Because for me personally, I want I, I want either Glover. Or uh, Gegar. Like I said, I love Musasi. Musasi is one of my favorite fighters. And I hope he gets a title shot. Huh? I hear he might be going to 185. Gegard versus Anderson Silva? Book it. <laughs> I wouldn't care. Hell, I, I, whoever wins that fight, I'm happy. I don't even care if Gegar, if Gegar disappoints. I mean, book it. I don't give a shit. I would love that. But a fight me and you, I think, are looking forward to more than the main event, would you say? Next fight, would would you say you're looking oh, for? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Junior Dos Santos versus Mark Hunt. Uh, this used to be a Junior Dos Santos versus Overeem, but rallying for Mark Hunt. Mark Hunt probably one of the biggest fan favorites for for us hardcore fans. I don't know if casual fans really know who Mark Hunt is, but for us hardcore fans, Mark Hunt's like one of our biggest. Like we, everyone pretty much loves Mark Hunt. If you're a hardcore MMA fan, I don't think like there's any hardcore fan that says I hate Mark Hunt. Like. We pretty much all love the guy. Mark Hunt versus Junior Dos Santos. This will be flying in this fight. It's going to be nuts. And uh, I don't know. I, I think you've got to give Hunt some of a chance. But oh, I, I am. Like an angry Junior Dos Santos and a very determined Junior Dos Santos. Yeah, see, this is why this fight works well. Because Mark Hunt, you know, he comes out, he surprises all of us, he knocks fuckers out, and you're like, man... That guy's a fucking badass. Why doesn't he have a title shot? But then you got Junior Dos Santos. 
and Junior Santos is pissed off. Like, this is going to be pissed off Junior. I, I feel, though, you know, Velasquez versus Dos Santos, I feel like if they do move, make it a trilogy, I feel it's one of the best trilogies in MMA history. Not the greatest of all time, but one of the best. It'd be up there, definitely. But, I don't know, I think Hunt, you know, he's very strong. He could take punishment, we see, but... I don't know. Could we see possibly a repeat of when Junior fought Roy Nelson? That doesn't need to coin, you know, just saying it because Mark Hunt's chunky like Roy Nelson, but he can he can withstand punishment. And I, uh, I, I, I think we could see sort of a, a kind of like what you were saying. I think that we're going to see a little bit more wrestling than what Roy Nelson was trying to do because Mark Hunt has great takedowns. Like most people don't see that because they just see his punching power. But I, I feel we could see, you know, what you were saying with Roy Nelson. I, I think we could see sort of like that type of fighting style in, in their fight. I, I really do feel like we could probably see that same type of fight, which wasn't a bad fight. I actually enjoyed that fight, uh, Dos Santos and Roy Nelson. So if no one has ever seen that fight, go check it out. Um, it's a really pretty solid fight. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind if they had that type of fight. But if anyone's going to get knocked out here, who do you think it is? Is it JDS or Mark Hunt? Uh, it's got to be Mark Hunt, but... Uh... Never count on more count, though, man. But that, Jesus Christ, you know, just his damage, like what he did to Stroop, man. And obviously, I think JDS is a lot smaller. I don't think JDS is going to stand there like a dumbass. Yeah, like, well, because Stephen Troops just thinks, oh, I'm the skyscraper. If I stand here, no one's going to hit me because they can't reach my chin. No, Stephen Troops, if you stand there, they have a better chance of hitting your chin. Pretty much, yeah, but. I say JDS, man, you look at him, he's very fast and he's a pretty complete fighter. And, and determined. Former yeah. former I UFC heavyweight champion. I'm out of vengeance. Yeah, and uh, pretty much, okay, if Mark Hunt wins, does he get an automatic title shot against Cain Velasquez or do you have to fight someone else? No, nah, absolutely. He has to get a title shot. That would be a, first be a five fight winning streak. He's on four right now. It would be five and he's pretty much being the number two guy. To me, there's no one really else out there. I think Roy Nelson would probably fight Cormier, and that would be the next number one contender shot. Because I think Hunt has more of a claim to a touch shot than Nelson. So, so, what about JDS? Do you feel JDS, if he wins this fight, does he have to go fight someone else, or does he get an automatic title shot? I think Dana has already hinted that he will get another title shot. Uh... I guess we'll have to see how impressive it looks, but uh, heavyweight division is kind of a shuffle right now. There's mm-hmm. a lot of good fighters, but personally, if I'm... I, I, I feel would... the the Ultimate Fighter, because I didn't even know they filmed the season two of the Ultimate Fighter Brazil. I feel like that put the heavyweight division also in a standstill because you lost Redoom, who, who's actually looked really good since coming back uh, to the UFC. Fabricio Redoom has been gone, and same with Nogueira because of the heavyweight. Uh, Shane Carwin keeps like, Nah, like, I don't know what's wrong with them. I think his body is, like, shutting down or something like that. I actually have some info because, I, I, you know, you saw a lot. You know, I was at like, UFC Access. Like, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Dana White had a Q&A, and I was one of the first to ask questions. I did ask more Shane Carl because, for people don't know, Shane Carl was a pretty big deal in, like, 2010, yeah. as a level. Oh, he was I, a I, big star. Yes, I agree. I, I, I want to know what's so up with Shane Carlin. So what, what is up with Shane Carlin? Well, you know, he hasn't fought since, I think, June 2011 in JDS. And I asked him about it, he's like, he's been, yeah, he's actually gone through a mini depression because, you know, he was supposed to fight Roy Nelson last December and he got hurt and he was actually really depressed about it because it's worked his ass off, you know, to get healthy finally. But now he's got his head on straight. They haven't booked anything for him yet, but... You know, they're okay. playing a return for him, but... Because, like, if, if anyone doesn't know, MMA does not get on ESPN. The, the first time MMA, I could say, got on ESPN was, I believe it was Ortiz versus Liddell 2 or 3. One of those times. But one of the major events of MMA that really got them big on ESPN and what made, like, a lot of casuals tune in I know a lot of people like to say UFC 100. That did help. But one of the biggest events, because after that UFC 116 event came UFC 117. So you had two great events back to back. Um, UFC 116, it was Shane Carwin and Brock Lesnar. And Shane Carwin, if you saw Shane Carwin, it's probably like the most likable dude ever. I mean, 
simple country man. Guy really is nice, can is well spoken, and he hits like a Mack truck. Okay, this guy hits like a Mack truck. He's like a Terminator. Okay, that's what Shane Carwin does. Okay, Shane Carwin is a great fight. Is a great like representative of the company. He's a great guy, a pretty good fighter. He's someone that I would pay money to see every time. If you said, "Hey, there's a Shane Carwin pay per view coming up," I'm forking over sixty dollars and saying, "Yes, I'm seeing that pay per view." I did it for the Lesnar pay per view, and I did it when he fought Junior Dos Santos, and I didn't regret any of those purchases. I love both of those purchases. Those were great pay per views. So it was just like Shane Carwin knows how to make money. And then obviously everyone knows what 117 was. If you don't know UFC 117, go look it up. It's probably has one of the greatest fights in MMA history. And not only that, one of the greatest uh, build-ups in MMA history. That's so much publicity. Yeah, Carwin was really a big deal at one mm -hmm. point. But, you know, he hasn't fought in almost two years. And, you know, MMA is an evolving sport. You know, one month is a new guy. And then next month or next three months is a new guy hot. Yeah. And, you're out this long, man. You know, it's not like wrestling. You know, it's gonna take an impact on your popularity. Yeah, because like I like Shane Carr. I, I I was trying to figure out where, where is this guy because I remember he was supposed to fight Roy Nelson and then he just disappeared. So at least he's taking this shit seriously. I thought that like you know he just wasn't fighting anymore. Like he just gave up. But at least he's he was you know he's taking this shit seriously and he's ready to you know go at it again. But that would have been a fun fight, Emmett Nelson, man. I don't know all that would have been. Dude, I just have been too fuck. Well, my friend's favorite fighters are Roy Nelson and Junior uh, and, and Shane Carwin. He's that's like, and I told him he was they're gonna fight, and he was really upset when I said Shane Carwin got hurt. So he was like, "God damn, it, I want to see those two fights so bad." Those are his two favorite fighters, so he he was excited for that fight, but too bad it never happened. But moving on forward, the main event. And UFC does not even want to say his last name. And I and frankly, I don't blame UFC for using his nickname instead of his last name. Because, okay, if you heard Velasquez versus Silva, what comes to your mind when you hear Silva? Anderson. <laughs> Anderson. You don't want to put Silva. You want to try to avoid Silva last name in general. Because if I heard Velasquez versus Silva, I'd be like, wait a minute. Anderson Silva's going to fight Cain Velasquez? Holy shit. But... <laughs> The pay-per-view title is uh, is Velasquez versus Bigfoot 2. Uh, the first fight, uh, I don't know if this is worthy of a, a, a number, uh, as a number fight, okay? I don't think it's worthy of that stature, but... Kim Velasquez beat the shit out of Bigfoot. That's saying it nicely. <laughs> but, dude, there was a puddle of blood within at least two minutes of the fight. Oh. You just saw it was easily one of the bloodiest fights I've ever seen. Yeah, I agree. It was crazy. I was just like, oh my god. And everyone's just like, Kane wants that fucking title back. Like, a lot of people were like, th this fight was after when, I was it the fight after Kane lost the belt, or did he fight someone else before? No, no, it was his first fight after losing the belt. Okay, because I wasn't 100% sure, because I thought that he may have fought. But this was after he lost the title. We were, this was on the same card. Was it the same card as uh, Mir versus Dos Santos, because yeah, it, it, like, it was the all heavyweight. Yeah, it was the all heavyweight card, and you know a lot of people were just like, "Oh, you know, Bigfoot Silva, he, he, Bigfoot Silva, he's a solid fighter." Blah blah blah. All of a sudden, like Kane Velasquez just comes, destroys him, and everyone's like, "Give Kane the title shot." If you're not giving Kane the title shot, Dana, you're on crack. And pretty much everyone's Dana White had nothing else to say. He was just like, "All right, go." Kane get like a lot of fans wanted Kane to get the title shot, and. Really, to be honest here, Kanan, Kanan Dos Santos, it, it, it's probably like one a great little border war in a way, like Mexico versus Brazil. It's kind of like that in a way, Mexico versus Brazil. So there's a lot of good border war issues there that you can discuss. But he's facing Bigfoot, another Brazilian. Um, I don't know. The, like Antonio Silva, yes, he defeated uh, Alistair Overeem. But do we give him much of a chance here? Like, if you're in Vegas, Alan, and you see the odds to this fight, would you risk betting money on Bigfoot? That's what I'm saying. If you went to Vegas and you had a hundred dollars and you could make a lot of money out of this, would you put money on Bigfoot, knowing that you're losing a hundred dollars, but you're like, eh, it was a good hundred dollars? Would you bet on Bigfoot in this fight? Nah, I don't see it happening. So okay. No. I just think Kane's just an absolute machine. Like I did. I think his striking could have improved a little bit, but otherwise, I think he's just so versatile and so, like, you know, I think he's just a complete fighter. And mm -hmm. I hope so, guys, his takedown defense right here. You know? 
yeah. it's great to you know, avoid it and try to keep it stand up. Yeah, because th this fight right here, it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, an interesting heavyweight bout. Like, Bigfoot always has those what the fuck moments in him. So we don't know what Antonio Silva is really, really going to do here. And it is really, really going to be an interesting fight between these two. I, I, I honestly cannot wait. And then we're, we're just going to go over one fight on the next card. I mean, there's a lot of good. Oh, that's who I was talking about. There we go. There he is. Um, on the UFC on Field TV, Nogueira versus Redoom card, which is the Ultimate Fighter of Brazil 2 finale. Um, pretty much, there's a lot of solid fights on the card. But there's only really like two fights that I really want to talk about. Uh, Tiago Silva, he's taking on Rafael Cavalanchi. And what's his nickname? Because there's Jacare and then there's Feja. Feja. Yeah, Feja. There we go. There, that who I was trying to see. I, I always get those two mixed up. Feja and Jacare. I always get those two mixed up. Tiago Silva lose. I see him getting cut, man. There, I agree because remember at one point when he was facing Machida. Undefeated Tiago Silva versus undefeated Leota Machida, and afterwards, and, and the funny thing was, Leota Machida. A lot of people did not give him a lot of credit facing Tiago Silva because at the time, before he fought Tiago Silva, I believe Leota fought Tito Ortiz, and this was Tito on the way out. Tito Ortiz. So this was like pathetic Tito Ortiz. This was like, you know, if you were like one of those fans that were watching UFC and you loved Tito Ortiz, you kind of didn't love him anymore because it was kind of like a uh, I hate to go professional wrestling, but it was kind of like a John Cena effect. It was kind of like you're like, yeah, he was cool at first. Now he's just a douchebag. You don't yeah. really like him. That, that's what, what Tito was going through. And it was kind of interesting when Tito Ortiz almost won that fight in the third round. Like he, he was the first guy ever to beat Machida in a round. So a lot of people said Tiago Silva was going to be the one facing either uh, Rashad or Rampage um, at the time. But it turned out to be Machida, and I agree. If Tiago Silva loses this fight, he, he is out of the UFC. He's out of the door. He has to win since 2009, and, you know, he's been caught with drugs for the past few times. Mm -hmm. And especially the fights where he, he pretty much is going to, um, where he's supposed to win, you know. He, he doesn't, what's it called? He does, like, he gets caught with drugs. Uh, Brandon Vera, he won that fight. And what happened? No contest. He urine sample. And he failed that. Stanislav Nedkov, he won that fight. And what happened? Uh, tested positive for, I think, marijuana? Exactly. So it was just, like, pretty much, like, no contest, no contest. So he, he, he lost, like, he pretty much got, he pretty much lost those two fights. So, it, it, it I don't know, he's just on a downward track. Speaking <laughs> Last guy beat was Keith Jardine. Oh, the Dean of Mean. Yeah. <laughs> I, I miss the Dean of Mean. He was the Leonard Garcia, the light heavyweight division. He was. That's a, damn, that's a very good comparison. But I think Keith Jardine did fight in more major fights. Well, Leonard Garcia was more of just a you know, prelim guy. Yeah. No, I I, I miss Jardine. I, I, ho I hope that he, he he can make one-time appearance. I, I know Dana's like, ooh, we, we don't have the money. Just, just sign Jardine to, like, $2 fights. I don't know. But... <laughs> Uh, Jack, uh, Fajal, Fajal versus Silva. It's going to be an interesting fight. I think Fajal at one point was the strike force light heavyweight champion. I could be wrong. Was he? Yes, he was the strike force light heavyweight champion. And he lost his title to Dan, Danson, Dan Henderson. So really, to be honest, when you lost to Dan Henderson, that's not a bad fight to lose to. It's a good point. Yeah. So... Beijiao is taking on Tiago Silva. And speaking of Tiago, where's Tiago Alves? Is he dead? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I, you know what I'm doing with the heavyweight division? Maybe put the winner of Nogueira Word, uh, Verdum and JDS were to win. Maybe, face, maybe do JDS versus Verdum. Or, I don't know. I don't think JDS and Nogueira are really good friends. I don't know if they fight each other. But uh, I think he's just such a mess. I'm trying to figure out what's up with Tiago Alves. That, that's my biggest concern. Oh, his last fight was UFC on FX against Martin Campman. How long ago was that? Um, That was in March 3rd, 2012. So he's been gone. Uh, pretty much everyone that he was trying to fight, he, he's either been injured or that guy's been injured. He, he seems like he's out of, on his way out the door. 
So, I mean, he had some brain surgery, so ho hopefully he's fine. I, I I hope the UFC keeps him around for a little bit. But now on to the big fight, Redoom versus Big Nog. Now, Redoom has done something <laughs> that Big Nog has never done in his career, and he, that is beat the legendary Fedor Emelianenko. So does this give Redoom, you know, a shot at Big Nog? I definitely, he definitely has a shot, but uh, the gear looks. See, I think the gear kind of looks his age. I, I still, I think it was more that uh, Dave Herman's mm -hmm. uh, bad game plan than Nogueras' skill, but he's always dangerous, Nogueras, especially on the ground. Then. Yes. But I, I, oh, I, there's a four in so long. Just this, this fight is very interesting, but I. Honestly, I couldn't make a prediction. It's just Yeah, no, the same here. This fight could go either way. It literally can go either way. Like, uh, for me, Redoom, I feel ever since bes entering the UFC, besides, like, I feel Redoom ever since, like, his loss to Junior Dos Santos, which was, like, ages ago for most of you people, um, he, he he's really done a really good job minus the Alistair Overwing fight. I feel that he has been a better fighter I feel like, you know, he's improved himself so much. I mean, I feel like Fabricio Redoom, if anyone has a shot, like if any guy that you think that could, that you wouldn't think would win the heavyweight championship, I feel like he has a chance at winning the heavyweight title. Yeah, I, would, I could see that because he's, I think he's very versatile. Like, mm -hmm. I don't see much, many holes in his game. He's strike. He could, you know, he's gone the ground. I mean, he 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 was he and he has a chin too. I mean, he was taking hit huge shots against Roy it's Nelson. Roy, yeah, that, those were some huge shots against him. Like I remember that fight. That was a really, uh, pretty good fight against Roy Nelson. So I, I, I'm looking forward to Rodrigo Nogueira taking on Fabricio Redoom. I feel that it's going to be a really good fight. Um, I honestly cannot wait. And so, pretty much just for previewing for next time we do talk about UFC, because I feel like that's when we're going to, uh, when we do this podcast about MMA next time. Uh, next time, when Alan and I talk about MMA, we will be covering UFC 161, which will have Brandon Burrell defending his bantamweight title against Eddie Wineland, and also Mauricio Rua versus uh, Little Nog, so Shogun and Little Nog, and also Rashad Evans versus Dan Henderson, so two good wrestlers going at it. Uh, we got also Pat Barry, who we hope both lose so he can be cut forever. Um, oh, man. Uh, I just hope Pat Barry one day comes out of the California dream. And... <laughs> I hope you got that reference. Yes. And I hope not ever. And then also we'll discuss UFC 162, which features Anderson Silva facing Chris Weinman and Chan Sun Jun versus Ricardo Lamus, who we who we think will fight the winner of Pettis versus uh, Aldo when that happens. Also, Mark Munoz, the Filipino recce machine, I believe that's his nickname, is facing Tim Boat. Huh? Uh, what, what's his What's his nickname? The Filipino fat machine. Oh, I yeah. do not like Mark Munoz one bit. I, I, he talks, I just think he talks himself so highly. It's kind of like Bisping. <laughs> At least like Bisping wins, you know? Yeah, Mark, Mark Munoz is a solid wrestler. And also, Frankie Edgar will be finally fight, not fighting for a title. So that's a really solid card to talk about, and it, we will. I think he'll win that one. I think he he'll, he'll win. I think the judges will pick him to win this. Oh, against Charles Oliveria? Who the fuck is he? The judges don't know who the hell he is. Did he get knocked out by Cub Swanson? Exactly. That's a weird fight for Frankie to take. You think he'd take? You know, maybe fight one of the upcomers, like a, you know, like a Cub Swanson or a. Or a Korean zombie, or a Korean Nah, that, Frankie Edgar. Because, like, if he beats Korean zombie, then it's like, oh, he has to get the title shot. Five, like, six. if he faces either Llamas or Zombie, it's pretty much you give him the title shot no matter what, because those two are, like, arguably one or two uh, featherweight contenders. Mendes. Huh? Don't forget about Chad Mendes. Uh, Ch Chad Mendes is kind of, like, in the rebuilding structure. Pretty much he has to hope one of those fuckers loses. Like, let's say if those two weren't fighting each other and they just lost randomly, then Chad Mendes jumps up between both of them. Kind of like Wyman did in the middleweight division. Yeah, pretty much. Because like, Michael Bisping fucked up, and then so they're like, oh, uh, Chris Wyman, go out there. Rashad fucked up. And then also the final card that we're going to be doing um, for the next time is UFC on Fox Sports 1, I believe. Uh, Johnson versus 
Morga and that's Demetrius Johnson. Better up uh, to well featherweight, flyweight, or as I like to call them, methweight uh, <laughs> champions taking on Do John Moraja and also hopefully Roy McDonald does not bitch out of another fight. Oh, and also and he's facing Jake Allenbeger. And also we got Misha Tate versus Liz Camucci. And after you saw Misha Tate's last fight and Liz Camucci's last fight. I'm pretty sure most of you fuckers want to see that fight, especially free on TV. Yeah, be, uh, probably yeah, we will discuss more of those. And also with the WWE, for all you wrestling fans, what we will talk about next time, most likely when me and Alan do get back together, I believe maybe Slammiversary may have passed. If not, we'll do a quick little Slammiversary predictions. But 100% sure Extreme Rules will have passed. So yeah. we will discuss Extreme Rules uh, in depth, talking about where that's going to lead and maybe some Raw and SmackDown and all that other good stuff. So pretty much that's what you're going to expect next time when we talk about wrestling and MMA together. Uh, if, if an event of a UFC is near at that time, we will discuss predictions. Also, uh, next time me and Alan get together, we will have a podcast talking about, so far, the NBA playoffs. A lot of interesting things in this first round, uh, besides Miami and Milwaukee and Lakers and Spurs. Uh, we have a lot of really good matchups. I feel like this first round has been really, really solid. And then we will also talk about the NFL draft and some other NFL stuff as well. So, hope you guys stay tuned. Uh, most likely, this will be posted on Thursday. And hope you guys are ready for Saturday when we discuss NFL and NBA. Um, Alan, is there anything else you want to say before you talk? You you say anything to these people again? I'm good. And, you know, keep listening. Because now yes. we're doing a different variety of stuff. And have to get more information on everything in general. Yes, exactly. So NBA and NFL coming to you guys Saturday. I also will have an individual video talking about the Shield itself and why I think they're probably one of the greatest scenes in professional wrestling today. So, um, yeah, be be staying tuned to my channel. Um, follow Alan on Twitter. Very good Twitter follower. To the very good Twitter to follow. I suggest it. So it's at Alan underscore Sterk. Just follow him on Twitter. It's not that hard. I mean, just do it, people. And, and also follow me on Twitter, at ChaseOliver68. And I'll keep plugging his Twitter until you guys follow him. Like, I want to see at least, like, his Twitter follow Twitter followers get up to 300. I mean, come on, guys. If I have 300 Twitter followers and I don't do shit on there, he, he should have more. So, definitely follow him on... Triple H voice to end this. Yes, sir. Remember, uh, I'm the king of kings, uh. And you are listening uh, to the Wrestling Roundtable revamped. Because uh, remember, uh, Brock Lesnar and Triple H. Uh, me, the game, the Cerebral Assassin, the King of Kings, uh, is going to steal the show at Extreme Rules. And remember, guys, always you can subscribe by clicking the little icon down below. Or, brother, or. Comment down below. And where's your goddamn impact reviews, Chase? Um, Hulk Hogan, I'll get around to that. It's called the working world. We have jobs. I don't need a job, brother. You know what I do? I really don't care, Hulk Hogan, what you do. God damn it, brother. Also, comment down below. You guys know the drill. We'll see you all on Saturday. And sorry about my channel schedule kind of being weird for most of you people. And also, Q&A will most likely be up on Friday. So, you guys will get four Chase Oliver videos in a row. So, yay. Uh, talk to you all later. Peace.